No part of this lecture material may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. How you doing? This is Professor Rick Ramos and we're going to be starting off with our first lecture in Adjust 221 here at Contra Costa College and the uh, course is the uh, legal aspects of evidence. So I have to tell you right away that in uh, the state law enforcement academies, both parole and um, corrections and police, you're required to uh, pass minimum skills tests uh, on knowledge. One of the areas that's the highest two areas that are flunked out, uh, where people have to be remediated or flunk out of the academy, is LD15, which is laws of arrest, which is covered in our criminal procedures course. And the second is actually the area of um, the legal aspects of evidence, which are covered in a, a number of different of learning domains from the police academy, including LD-16, um, search and seizure, and presentation of evidence, LD-17. When I say LD, what I mean by that is learning domains, and that's kind of how the state has divided up the different required um, areas of knowledge that you have to acquire. So anyhow, to be successful in this course, like any other course, you need to listen to the lecture, and I'm going to try to break it down to layman's terms so you understand what we're talking about. But it's very, very important that you read the textbook. If you don't read the textbook in most of my courses, you're not going to be able to pass. You're going to uh, fail. So it's really important that you are doing your, your weekly reading assignment. So here we go, lecture one, introduction of evidence. The first thing you need to know is that the officer's role is to collect, document, and preserve evidence. They're the hunter and the gatherer. So they're out on the street. You make a stop. You make an arrest. You're responsible for the collection of that evidence of preservation and making sure that it's uh, going to be presentable in court. Now, there's what I call the thin blue line. And what I mean by that is that officers are required to follow certain rules. When you become a police officer, you swear up to uphold the Constitution and the laws of the state and government that you're working for. So an officer promises to follow the rules. They swear to it. It's so easy to get caught up. You know, you have these crooks that are out there that are, that are gaming, they're, they're doing crimes, and they're getting away with it simply because either somebody doesn't call them or you don't get there in time, but you get information that they've done it, and, and it, it can become a challenge to continue to follow the rules. But you know, every dog has his day and eventually you will catch that person. So if you do a good job, if you really know what you're doing and you, you do follow the rules, that person's going to go away for a long time. You're going to get them off the street. So the bottom line is, is officers have to follow rules. There's just a thin line between the cop and the crook. And that line is your word that you're going to uphold the laws and of the United States and the state of California, if that's where you're working. There are also laws and rules that protect citizens and punish the officer if they don't do a good job. The exclusionary rule protects defendants when officers collect evidence illegally. If you do a dirty search on someone, it's going to get excluded later on, and you might actually be um, liable criminally under Title 18, Section 241 or 242 under the United States Code. And what that says is that under 241, if you conspire to violate somebody right, somebody's rights, example, I make a car stop, I tell my partner, pull the person out of the car, keep them busy over here talking to them, I'm going to go look inside the car, and I start searching the car. And uh, we're both working as a team, so we're conspiring more than one, there are two, two or more persons who are, have a, a, an agreement to commit a criminal act, which is a violation of Fourth Amendment. Hey, we could go to jail, we could go to prison behind that. We're also liable under civil liability where the individual can sue us and get damages for violating their rights. And of course, your police department can discipline you because they have rules and regulations covering how to do searches and how to stop folks. And lastly, you make the department look bad in the press. So let's start off with the definition of evidence. It's anything presented to the senses when offered in court to prove a fact. Evidence is used in a variety of different ways. Evidence plays an important role in criminal cases. 
The district attorney reviews evidence before deciding whether or not to sign a complaint on an individual. The way that you collect evidence is important because under a 1538 motion, someone could get the evidence suppressed. The case could be filtered out because of a lack of evidence, and the decision could be made by the prosecutor after a motion or a preliminary hearing, or a case could be dis dismissed by court because of an evidentiary problem. In trial, the defendant is convicted at trial due to the strength of inculpatory evidence. Inculpatory means it tends to prove guilt. Exculpatory means it tends to prove innocence or guiltlessness. Let's talk now about the five different types of uh, evidence or definitions of evidence. The first is testimony, which is a sworn statement given in court by a lay or expert witness who has personal knowledge of the facts being tried in the case. And we'll speak more about that in chapter three. Next is writings, number two. Any document or tangible form of communication, including handwriting, computer data, business records, photographs, audio or videotapes. And we'll talk about that in chapter four. Material objects, physical objects, including real evidence, fruits of the crime, instrumentality, contraband or physical evidence, and demonstrative evidence, including displays or diagrams presented in court to virtually illustrate evidence. And this is what will be covered in chapter five. Trier of fact, the judge or magistrate, depending on the nature of legal proceeding before the court or the jury also. And proof, which is establishing with evidence a requisite degree of belief concerning a fact in the mind of the trier of fact. Translation, when you show somebody evidence that what makes them believe a particular fact is true or not. And that person happens to be the judge or the jury, the person that's deciding upon guilt. So I want to talk about the difference between evidence and proof. Evidence is information which is allowed in court, while proof is the effect produced by the information. If I bring a 9mm Glock pistol with the suspect's fingerprints on it into court, that would be the evidence. But proof is that we we show ballistic evidence also that this is the gun that killed the victim in the case and the gun was found in the possession of the suspect. So that proof is the effect produced by this information. You have the suspect's gun, you have the suspect's fingerprints, the, the, the ballistic matchup to bullets coming out of that weapon striking the victim and the fact that it was, it was found on the suspect. That would be the proof. Now let's talk about burden of proof. And this is the obligation to produce evidence sufficient to prove a fact or set of facts. Now the prosecution has a burden of proof in the following areas. They have to show that the suspect is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt because each person under the constitution is presumed innocent. They also have the responsibility to show that there's corpus delecti for the crime. The prerequisite for this course is Adjust 121, Concepts of Criminal Law. And in that course you learn about corpus delecti, which are the elements of the crime. Well, the prosecution must show that the crime was committed, the act, intent, etc. They also have to show that there's probable cause for the search or arrest. That has to be established. The burden of proof is on the prosecution. And if there's any admissions or confessions, they have to be shown that they're voluntary. That's the other requirement that they have under burden of proof. Now, the defense has also a burden of proof on a number of different issues. They include insanity. They include involuntary intoxication, meaning that somebody slipped them some drug and it made them go crazy and stab somebody. On double jeopardy, they would have to show that they've already been prosecuted on this case and found guilty or innocent. And on self-defense, where you're saying that, yes, I did kill the person, but it was because they were a danger to me. I want to move to the next topic, which is purposes and reasons for the rules of evidence. And there are a number. The rules of evidence serve to promote and preserve our due process system of justice. Our United States criminal justice system is unique compared to other countries in the world. We have the 14th Amendment, which basically says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. And our system strives toward the presumption of innocence and the right to discover and cross-examine evidence. The privilege against self-incrimination is important and the right to uh, present exculpatory evidence on one's behalf and a legal process for excluding unlawfully obtained evidence. So there's all these rules in place. And that basically goes with the rule of to seek the elements of fair justice and due process of law. 
The second one would be to prevent jurors from becoming confused, misled, or exposed to unreliable evidence. A criminal jury is charged with deciding matters of fact and determining whether or not someone committed a crime or not. The members of a jury make factual decisions based upon relative strengths and weaknesses of the evidence that we provide them to look at, and they have to decide what weight to give to that evidence as it comes before them. Now, on the other side, a magistrate decides on the matters of law and instructs the jury in the legal interpretation of that. It's important that we have rules to protect jurors from becoming confused or misled. The rules of evidence keep the juror or jury from hearing irrelevant or unreliable evidence. A judge can also exclude evidence based upon its probative value if that value, and that basically is uh, how well it proves a point. And when they weigh that against the possibility of the fact that the admission of this evidence will will bring upon undue consumption of time or create substantial damage of undue prejudice or confuse the issues or mislead the jury, they may not allow it in. Rules of evidence are there to prohibit the introduction of tainted or unreliable or illegally obtained evidence. The judge is charged with the responsibility to determine the, the admissibility of evidence. And this is based upon the Constitution. The judge is there to make sure that the rights of the individual are not violated. Let's review some of the constitutional amendments that would be pertinent in reviewing evidence. The Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. The Fifth Amendment, which deals with the Miranda Rule and the right to um, not testify against yourself. The Sixth Amendment, the right to counsel or suggestive lineup show up. And the Fourteenth Amendment, which is shocking seizure or coerced statement of evidence. So again, review of uh, reasons for excluding evidence to reduce violations of constitutional safeguards, including the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Fourteenth Amendment. And what's there is the big hammer that the court would use on the police if they bring in tainted evidence. It's called the exclusionary rule. The rules of evidence are also there to avoid undue prejudice to the accused. And I spoke about that earlier. To prohibit consideration of unreliable evidence, including hearsay or opinion evidence, and protect valued interests in relationships, including privileged communications. And we're going to get into this a little bit deeper. When we talk about protecting privileged communications or privileged relationships, what we mean is there's a statutory reason where a, a witness can legally refuse to testify in court. And that is the Fifth Amendment, which says you don't have to incriminate yourself. Then there's also the husband and wife, doctor and patient, attorney, client, and clergy, confessor privileges that we'll go over really quickly. When a judge feels that evidence is going to be too prejudicial, confusing, or time-consuming, the magistrate might exclude it. An example could be a really gross or gruesome photo of the victim with their head cut off. The reason that that might be something that would be excluded is the jury can be told about it, but they don't need to be grossed out by that photo because that, that grotesque photo could cause undue prejudice where they feel they have to find somebody guilty and they're going to find that person that happens to be sitting in the defendant's chair as the guilty party. Evidence also prohibit the introduction of unreliable evidence. When an officer collects evidence, they have to authenticate it. In other words, say in the report where they found it, they have to start a chain of custody, meaning that they have to take that evidence and package it and put safeguard it so that it's not tampered with in between the time that they touch it and they send it to the lab for analysis and it comes back to them and they bring it into court. They may have to look at what's called the Kelly Fry ruling, which is in scientific evidence, which says that whatever test was used on that particular piece of evidence is accepted by the scientific community. They may have to also uh, verify hearsay evidence, and we'll get into that when we talk about hearsay, but it's where I was told by someone else that they heard somebody say something. So if John heard Mary say, I'll kill him if I see him again, and John tells me that, if I testify in court, I say, well, John told me that Mary said that is hearsay, all right? And witness competency, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, the rules of evidence deal with is a person a sane individual? Can they actually see or do what they say they were able to see or they were able to hear? 
And those are things on reliability we deal with. And again, the court has a variety of motions where they can get rid of, uh, of evidence. A 1538 motion deals with the legality of a search or seizure. The 402 motion deals with the legality of an admission or, com- of, or confession regarding Miranda issues. A competency motion is to determine a witness's ability to give testimony. And a 352 motion is an undue prejudice motion asking that the evidence be excluded. So, next topic is triers of fact. And when we deal with triers of fact, we're dealing with the judge, and we're dealing with the jury. The jury's duty is to hear or receive evidence and determine matters of fact, to give weight to different evidence presented. In other words, they review the evidence and they determine how important it is and whether or not they believe uh, that it's important, first of all, or that it's applicable to the case. The judge's duties are different. The judge can wear two different hats. Basically, the judge can wear a hat where they're a trier of fact or they deal with the question of fact, and they can wear another hat that says they, they deal with matters of law. And um, depending on what type of trial it is, if it's a jury trial, then they're only wearing the hat that says that they deal with matters of law. They decide what qualifies as evidence. They decide what should be presented to the jury. They, and they decide uh, the sentence of the defendant, and they ensure the due process of law. If it's a jury, uh, I mean, if it's a court trial where the judge is making the decision, then they wear, they do everything the jury did plus the things I just talked about previously. The scope of the rules of evidence. What that means is, scope means how is something used or controlled? What is its limits of jurisdiction? In California, the evidence code has jurisdiction or is used in both civil and criminal matters. What's the difference between a civil and a criminal matter? If you look in your notes, I've provided you with a table that, that basically has three columns. The, the titles of those are the type of uh, law, next is the victim, and next is the punishment. Under criminal law, which is the type of law that we're going to talk about first, the victim is the people of the state or the United States. And the punishment is death, imprisonment, fine, removal from office, or disqualification from office. In civil law, the victim is the individual, and the punishment is sanctions or compensation. Now, the author has a variety of different examples I'm going to read to you about why you have rules of evidence. In the first example, the defendant was a middle school guidance counselor charged with sexual molestation of children under his supervision. A search of his residence located six sexually explicit magazines with fictional articles about adult men having sex with male children. The magazine was not used or displayed during the alleged crimes. The Ninth U.S. uh, Court basically ruled the introduction of the magazines was prejudicial. Mere possession of lawful reading material didn't tend to prove that the defendant engaged in child molesting. So that evidence, if it had been allowed, would uh, basically ignite some anger on the part of the jury and would be overly prejudicial, even though just possession of those magazines themselves was not unlawful. In a 1992 case, a defendant was charged with possession of an unregistered machine gun, and at trial, a photograph was introduced which not only depicted the machine gun, but also a dozen other guns and collector knives. The introduction of this photograph was prejudicial because it misled the jury by exhibiting dangerous weapons not otherwise relevant to the prosecution. Next example is during the O.J. Simpson case, Detective Mark Furman of the Los Angeles Police Department testified that he didn't use the despicable racial slur, quote-unquote nigger, and the defense sought to offer impeachment evidence that an author whom Furman had worked with in preparing a story had some recordings of Furman that he used the N-word over 40 times. Due to the repetitive, time-consuming, and emotionally charged nature of the statements, Judge Lance Ito invoked 352 of the Evidence Code to limit the presentation of this evidence. He permitted the author to testify to the actual number of statements made, but only to the actual content of two statements. The defense could, could only make its credibility point to impeach Furman, but not over and over again. In other words... What they said was, he used the N-word 40 times, okay? 
they basically showed two tape records in, of him using the N-word and then basically told the jury he used it 40 times because they didn't want to enrage the jury by having them hear that N-word that many times, especially the African-American jurors. The next example is that the defendant has a prior felony conviction for rape. He's now prosecuted on a new rape charge, and as a general rule, you know, previous convictions can't be revealed to the jury because just because you did a crime before doesn't mean you did this one, right? And so it's called basically guilt by association, and it's, it's bias. However, there are exceptions to the rule, including the propensity evidence, which we'll be talking about later, where it shows that a person has a propensity to commit crimes because of, because of some psychological problem or method of operation. They have a very unique way of, of uh, committing a crime which can be associated to them. Okay, well, that's the end of Lecture 1, Part 1, The Legal Aspects of Evidence.